Clawland here, and welcome to episode 8 of Left Hand Reviews. And today we're going to take a look at Panzer General Russian Assault. Panzer General Russian Assault was released in 2010 by Petroglyph Games and was designed by Chuck Krogel. It plays uh, in about 60 minutes with 1 to 2 players, which means, yes, there is a solitaire variant for this game. Uh, you may have heard of the previous game, which was Panzer General Allied Assault. But I'm going to take a look at, in particular, Russian Assault, even though the games are virtually identical. Um, this one it was released later, there's a couple updates to the rules, and uh, which people seem to think makes it a little more streamlined. So, this game uh, is a World War II tactical war game that uses uh, cards as units, rather than um, your normal uh, counters, and uses tiles to create the game board as opposed to a large hex map. So let's take a look at what comes in the box. I'll set up a two-player game, show you the basics of how it plays, and then I'll tell you what I think. So as you can probably tell, the box here is gigantic. Uh, so let's check out all the amazing components that come in this giant box game. First thing that we have here is a full-color rule book. This is not on glossy stock, this is more of a thick newspaper, um, which honestly I prefer because you don't have to hold it in that perfect angle where you don't get that horrible glare from the lights above you. So, kudos on that. It is in full color, although there is a lot of text and not as many examples as I would have liked. You have a cheat sheet here of the super simple 18 step combat process. 18 steps. But we'll get into that in a minute. We have a uh, the main board here, which tracks the turn, the combat, and the prestige and ammo levels for each player, the uh, Russian player and the German player. And we have a giant box insert. Why? Why did you do this? This could have easily been uh, folded and the box made about a quarter of the size that it is. Um, but I guess that's, uh, you know, how they try to command such a big price tag out of this, originally at least. Well, let's see what we got here. We have some uh, various plastic miniatures here. There are tanks, artillery, and infantry units in here. And that's for, obviously, both sides. We have some uh, various... Um, Chits here that go on the initial setup of the scenarios. Objective chits, dig in, bridge, and so on and so forth. But you can see right now that these are one-sided. I hate one-sided chits. They're just ugly. I don't see why it was such a big deal not to print them uh, two-sided, but one-sided. We have our morale chits here, which are two-sided, which is nice. Positive and negative morale tracking. Your fired and moved tokens, so you can keep track of which uh, units have acted that turn. Uh, various chits for the boards that will track the ammo, the combat, and other such things. Control markers, you place on areas of the map that you control, German and Russian. You have the action card deck, which is shared by both sides. This has all your different actions during the game. Then you have your Russian, um, I'm sorry, the German unit deck. So it's a pretty big deck of all the German unit cards. Same thing with the uh, Russian unit deck. Overall, there are 240 cards. So, you know, there's a, a lot of cards in this game, which is nice. Uh, these two cards, which I put off to the side. Why? Because the backs of these cards would indicate that they are action cards, when in fact they are the super ultimate special units for each side. Now how are you going to shuffle these into the unit deck? You're going to know exactly what units are coming up and know that you probably want to purchase those units. So essentially these are useless unless you put them in um, colored sleeves that don't show the backs. Um, this is a confirmed misprint, and it's it's pretty upsetting, actually. And we have the 36 
map tiles here. They're on a pretty thick uh, a cardboard stock. They're double sided which is nice. So in other words there are 72 different um, different tiles to lay out if you count both sides. So I'm going to set up a simple two player scenario here, here and I'll go over uh, the, the major mechanics of the game and then I'll wrap it up. So here's the first uh, two player scenario set up called Stalingrad and the rule book has about 12 different scenarios uh, split between uh, single player and two player. So let's take a quote, closer look at some of the components here. I mentioned earlier the uh, tracker board here. We have the German prestige and ammo here, the Russian prestige and ammo here. Ammo is tracked on the board with this little ammo token for each side. And the ammo is what you have to expend to use artillery fire, so, you know, supported artillery fire. Um, also, you have a token here which tracks your prestige. Um, for this particular scenario, you randomly decide who goes first, and the person that is going first starts off with 10 prestige. The person that is going second starts off with 20 prestige. That prestige is used to play uh, operations cards and to uh, purchase additional cards to your hand. At the top here we have the turn track, so after each turn this will move. On this particular scenario the game ends after the fifth turn unless the immediate end condition is met before that. And then finally here we have the combat track and I'll get more into this when I talk about combat but the person that is firing will use this to track their their combat strength and then the person who is the target uh, of that fire will use this to measure their combat strength. Now, what's kind of interesting about the combat I'll just touch on quickly is that each side will have an opportunity to fire and have an opportunity to be the target. So if I attack another player I uh, generally will fire first, and there are some situations where the defender would actually fire first, but I would do all my firing, then I'd calculate the target's value, and then we would calculate the damage, and then these reset, and you do it all again op from the opposite direction. So the person that was the target before is now the firer, and the person that fired is now the target. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting thing about the combat of this game. We also have the action uh, card deck here, so I'll just take a quick look at some of those. So these are going to be various actions that you can take, and depending on the type of card, determines when that action is taken. So this red bar here indicates that this is a combat action, so this is used during combat. Um, and then you can see this one actually has a different action for the Soviet player or the German player. On the bottom right hand there in the diamond symbol, is a five that is the prestige cost so in order to play this card you must expend five prestige from your prestige board there um, on the bottom left there is a one uh, I'll talk about that um, in combat as well as this two and then you have the title of course and the the picture there Let's see if I can find another one this is an operations card this is used during your operations uh, step and it would cost four to use and then you can see this has an OR condition, so you can execute either side of the OR. And there's one other type called a surprise. Surprise uh, has a green banner, and that is used in special situations, and you just have to read the card text uh, to see when that is used. Each player also has the deck of their units. This is the Russian one here, the German one's up there because that would be where the German player would be sitting in the case of this game. And there's a lot of different information on these uh, units here. Uh, this is a soft target as indicated by this man symbol there. All the units are divided between hard and soft. It does six damage versus hard units. As you can see that's six versus the tank symbol. And it does three damage uh, versus uh, soft units. It has a support value of 2 indicated by the radio there so if this is being used for support it provides 2 um, damage to the support. It has a defense of 2 and a initial morale of 2. Morale is essentially the health value. It has a 7 prestige meaning it costs 7 prestige to bring this onto the board.
And then this particular unit, as most units do, has some sort of special ability. So this has range support of two, meaning it can provide support from up to two tiles away. And it can move diagonally. Now normally when units move, they can't move diagonally. And there's various other units in there. Here's a, uh, an infantry unit. It has a support of five, which is very good. And we have some armor in there. And that's the same for both the German side and the Russian side. There's a lot of variety in the cards, which is nice. Now looking at the board here, you can see that the board, like I said, is comprised of all these different tiles. And we have a river in the middle here. So let's look at uh, a particular tile here. I'll pick this one up so we can examine the values on it here. This has a prestige cost of two, which is actually used for adding to your prestige bank at the beginning of your turn. So every, every um, tile that you control, you gain that much prestige at the beginning of your turn. This has a offensive value of zero, meaning if you are attacking from this tile, it adds this value to your attack, so in this case zero. And it has a defensive value of three, meaning if you are being attacked, it provides you three additional defense. And this is a village tile, and it is designated 5B. All 36 tiles have are numbered and have an A and a B side, so it's easy to quickly set those up uh, depending on what the scenario states. And this one, just as the scenario indicated, uh, is the home base for the Russian player. And this says minus eight cost. That just means that when you are paying to bring units onto the board, if you bring a unit onto your home base, it costs eight fewer prestige. Then these are the Russian control markers. That just indicates that these are the tiles that the Russian player starts control with, and this is called the home row, so it's important to know that. Then up at the top, we have the German home row and the German home base. And in between, you have various tiles that have different offensive and defensive values. The city factory tiles give you plus one ammo, so that's how you generate ammo each turn is by controlling those. You can also see here that we have some river tiles, and what's kind of silly about the river is in most war games, a river is an impassable uh, type terrain or a terrain that maybe armor can't pass through. Uh, but in this, it doesn't do anything. I mean, you can move through it as per normal, uh, but you're wondering what are these bridge tokens for? Well, the river tiles have a negative one modifier to attacking, so what the bridge does is negates that. So it turns it into a zero instead of a negative one. So, I mean, I guess that's good, but it's, it's a little hokey if you ask me. Then on the side here, we have, of course, our uh, other various chits here. You are fired and moved, so when a, a unit can generally only fire or move once in a turn, so you put these on it to indicate that. Uh, during combat, when uh, the uh, units take hits, you mark them down with these. This is the morale uh, tokens here, so as I noted before, they, each of the units has an intrinsic morale value, but as they are increased or reduced, you add these tokens to it to replace the value that's on the card. Now for this particular scenario, you can look in the, in the book here, and it tells you how to set it up, and it says each player starts with 30 prestige points from the unit deck. So basically what that means is they go through their unit deck, and they start out with 30 prestige points worth of units, but then it also says here no more than four units are allowed. So you can pick up the four different units uh, without a prestige value exceeding 30, and then you place those on your side of the board here, on your controlled, on your home row, I'm sorry. And that's what this particular scenario states. Some scenarios may have you starting with specific units uh, on specific places on the board, uh, but this one just says, pick 30 prestige points worth and put them on your home row. Uh, it's important to note that you cannot have more than one unit on a tile, uh, period. It cannot happen. And according to this scenario, the instant victory is awarded to the person that controls all the map tiles with the word city in them. So you can see we have a city factory, a city hill, city hill, and there's some up at the top of the board as well. So if 
one player controls all of those, they instantly win. Otherwise, at the end of turn five, whatever player controls the most tiles that have city in the name wins. If there's a tie, then the person with the most prestige uh, tiles controlled wins. And if it is still tied after that, then the Russian player wins by default. So let me uh, select some cards here and, and put them on the board, and then I'll walk through uh, the various actions you can take, and a, how combat works, and then I'll tell you what I think. So here you can see I've set up the game with the starting units for each side, and also the starting hands. Each player is going to start with six randomly drawn action cards, and two randomly drawn uh, unit cards, and that third card is the bluff card, so each player will have a bluff card as well that they'll use, and that um, that bluff card is used during combat, and I'll explain uh, when we get to combat. Now what happens is there are four phases to a turn, and the phasing player, that is the player whose turn it is, will complete all four phases, and then play will switch to the other player, and they will complete all four phases, and then the turn marker will advance to the next turn. So the first thing that you're going to do is draw cards and add ammo points. Now on the very first turn of the game you will not draw any cards because you're starting off with your starting hand. But if you were to draw cards, you would draw four cards in any combination from the community action deck and from your unit deck. The catch is, is you must say how many you're going to draw from each before you draw any. So I may say I'm going to draw two from here and two from here, and then you would draw those cards. After you draw those four cards, you can then purchase additional cards for four prestige points each. But you can only purchase cards up to ten cards in your hand. So that is to say, there is no hand limit per se, but you cannot purchase cards once your hand exceeds ten. So in this case, let's say it was a later turn, I had nine cards in my hand, then I do have the ability to purchase one additional card for four prestige points and I could choose which one and that's done one at a time so and those again those prestige points are tracked on this chart here so after you've drawn cards and uh, have the option to purchase additional cards you add your ammo points you get one ammo point for each city factory you control and you can see on the city factory tile there it says plus one ammo Right now, no one is starting with any city factories, so nobody gets any initial ammo points. But if I did, I'll take this ammo token here and move it onto the track accordingly to track my ammo points. The next phase of the turn is operations. That's the real meat of it. Then after operations, you will count your prestige uh, points, and then you have the ability to buy more additional cards for your next turn. And then in phase four is the victory determination, where you just see if you have won the game yet. So now, let's go over the operations. So the first action you can take is moving a unit. To move a unit, you can move it one space in any direction orthogonally, which is anything but diagonally, horizontally or vertically. Now there are some cards that may allow a diagonal move, and there may be some cards specifically that allow you to move more than one space. But you'll have to read the special abilities on each of the cards to know that. So let's say I wanted to move the cavalry. It uh, says moves twice, may enter swamps, may move diagonally. So this has some special abilities. So in this case, let's say I just want to move it uh, once. And I really want to gain control of that uh, city factory so I can have ammo on my next turn. So I'll move this diagonally here. And now, since I've moved it into an unoccupied space, I take one of my control markers and I put it on the tile there to show that I control that area. You can see this control marker from the tile that the cavalry just moved from stays there. So they will always, your control markers will always stay on tiles you have been on until they are occupied by your enemy, in which case they will switch control. Now once you've moved, since normally you can only uh, move or attack in a turn. I would take one of the move tokens here and place it on the unit just to remind me that that has moved. The next action you can take is digging in. So obviously this unit cannot dig in because he has already moved. 
So let's say the tank here wanted to dig in. There's really no real reason I would actually do that, but let's just say that he did. So I'm going to expend the action to dig in. Take one of these dug in markers and I place it on the unit there. And as you might expect, that gives you basically a defensive bonus and a first strike bonus. Uh, meaning if you are attacked because you're dug in, you actually get to fire first and you also get a plus two defensive bonus when you are defending. So that's the benefit of digging in. If this was to then move in a later turn, that uh, dug in marker gets removed. The next thing that you can do is fire, which is essentially initiating combat. You must be adjacent to an enemy unit to initiate combat. So let's say it was later in the game, and this guy was here. I could initiate combat uh, with the cavalry on the pack 88 here on a later turn because they're adjacent. Now we're assuming that it was later in the game and it hadn't actually moved, like the token wasn't there. And you attack, and then I'll go through the combat procedure in just a minute. The other thing you can do is place new units. So again, you have those couple units in your hand, and you'll get more obviously throughout the game. That's where this prestige uh, value comes into play. So the prestige of the engineers here is six. So I would expend six prestige points from the track down here. So move from 10 to four. And I must place them somewhere on the board where I have control. And I must be able to trace control all the way back to my home row. So in this case, let's say I place him here. Now once he's brought in, he can't move or fire or anything until his next turn. So what you can do is just take a moved marker and put it on him there just to show that you can now not do anything else with that unit this turn. Finally what you can do is play operations cards. So if you remember one of the card types, here we go, is operations, they have that blue banner and you can pay the prestige cost, in this case five, to expend and use this operation. In this case is replacements it says for the Soviet Union player, select any select a friendly unit and gain three morale. So let's say I, I want to play this. I bring myself down five on the track here, which actually I only had four, but let's say I had enough. I'll bring it down. This gets discarded and gain three morale. So uh, let's say oh, I want the the howitzer to gain three morale, which will bring it up to six. And remember, I said these are used to replace. So I just put a six on here it's for a total of six instead of three. Now you get to keep performing actions until you either can't perform any more actions or you choose not to perform any more actions. You can take the same action multiple times. You can take them out of order, meaning I could move and then attack and then move with another player, then bring in a unit, then play an operation, then bring in another unit. Any combination and number uh, that you want, provided you have the prestige and the cards to allow that. Once you are done, operations phase ends, and that's when you count prestige and have the ability to buy additional cards. Counting prestige means you count the prestige value on each of the tiles in which you have a unit on. So if this was the end of my operations turn right now, I would get 3, 4, 5, 6, 10, 12, and I would add 12 to my uh, prestige track here, and that's how you gain more prestige. You can also buy additional cards. And again, this is very similar to the uh, beginning phase, except for you must pay for prestige right off the bat. You don't get to draw, say, four free cards. And the reason you want to do this instead of waiting to the next turn is because after you've finished, it's now going to be your opponent's turn, and they're going to be moving and attacking you and all sorts of things. So if you expended a bunch of your cards on this, on your turn, and then opted not to purchase more cards, then you're going to leave yourself open for the opponent's attacking attacks and, and other actions. So you want to make sure that you have a nice stockpile of defensive cards when your turn ends. So let me set up uh, a, uh, a quick example of battle and we'll go through that wonderful 18 step battle process. So here's a quick combat example that I have set up. We're going to assume it's the Russian player's turn and their engineers are going to attack the Panzer Grenadiers. I flip the uh, German cards around just so it's easier to uh, see on the video, but normally they'd be turned around facing the opponent. 
So the first thing that we do is step one is determine who fires first. By default, the attacker is going to fire first unless the defender has a dug in marker, which they don't. So then we add the firepower of the attacking unit onto the uh, tracker board. We can see that we are attacking a hard type unit here as denoted by the symbol next to motorized infantry. And the engineers here do 11 damage versus hard type units. So we mark on the tracker, the combat tracker here, starts at 11. Next we add or subtract any morale for the firing unit. So during the game as they are taking morale hits or additions that will affect it. But in this case we have no morale modifications so that stays zero. But just for example's sake, say his morale was increased to six. Six is two greater than the start of four, so we would actually then increase our attack by two more. Or if we had taken these uh, morale damages during the game, and say his total morale was reduced to one, since that is three less than its start value of four, then that would actually subtract three from our combat strength. But since there's nothing on it, we take the full uh, uh, strength against hard units of 11. Then we add any supporting fire. So let's see if any of our units are going to support. Support is counted um, orthogonally and diagonally. So the cavalry here can take part because they have a range of one because they're just a standard unit and they are one diagonal here. So they're going to add in their support and it costs one. Or I mean, I'm sorry, it adds one. So I would add one to the track here, move to 12. Now we also have down here uh, the 152 millimeter howitzer. This has range support of three. So we can count one, two, or one, two, three, however you want to do it, but since you can move diagonally, one, two. So that is within range, and that will add support of three. So I'm going to add another three to this. One, two, three. Now since we are using artillery to support, that costs one ammo point, so we're going to move our ammo down one because we're using that ranged artillery support. So now we have a total of 15. We move on to the next step, which is adding or subtracting the terrain bonuses. So we are attacking here from the city factory. That gives us an attack bonus of zero, so no effect. Now we look at the defender, in this case the Panzer Grenadiers. And we look at their defense value, which is in the uh, blue shield here, and they start at 7. So we're going to go back to the track here, take the target marker, and it starts initially at 7. Then we add an additional 2 if the target is dug in, which they are not. Then we also add in the uh, terrain bonus. But since this is a hard unit, they do not get any terrain bonus. Uh, only soft units get the terrain uh, defensive bonus. But you can see in the special abilities, it says receives target terrain bonus. So they get it regardless, even though they're a hard target, a hard unit rather. And this, the river provides a defense of three. So we're going to add three to the combat track. One, two, three. So now they're at ten. Now we check if there's an overrun. So if the attacker has three times or greater as much combat power, then they overrun, the defending unit is destroyed, and they can advance into their space. But that's not the case here because it is 15 to 10. Then we check if there's a preemptive attack. That's essentially the reverse of the overrun. That is to say, if the defender has only two times as much attack power as the attacker, then the attacker immediately loses the battle. But again, we see that's not the case, so we move on. So the next step is uh, playing combat cards. So that's where you can look at your card uh, tableau here, or your card hand, and play any combat cards that you want. And you have to pay the prestige value. So let's say, uh, starting with the attacker, I'm going to play Deadly Fire. And Deadly Fire says, reduce morale by two to the enemy unit, may use one per combat. So I'm going to play that. I need to pay 
the five prestige. Oops. One, uh, two, three, four, five. And the Panzer Grenadier is going to suffer a minus two to their morale. And now it is their turn, so they will play a card. And then it comes back to me and I can play a card. And this goes back and forth until two players decide to pass. So let's assume they decide not to play any more any cards. It comes back to me. I decide not to play any cards. So we both pass, so we move on to the next step, which is sacrificing a card for its battle value. That's where those little red circles come into play. So you're both going to simultaneously choose a card uh, from your hand and reveal. And you're going to discard that card, leaves the game, or you know goes into the discard pile, and you add that red value to your attack total. And again, this is done simultaneously, and that's where that bluff card comes in. Because the bluff card has a value of zero, so if you actually don't want to get rid of any of your cards, you play the bluff card. And the bluff card will come back into your hand. So let's say I decided to use this one with a value of 4, so I'm going to discard it and add another 4 to here. 1, 2, 3, 4. And let's say they discard this card. That was a bad example. They discarded this card, which has a value of 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then we move on to the next step, which is drawing a tactical modifier. So the attacker is going to draw a card from the uh, action draw deck here. And that's where that bottom left value is going to come into play. That bottom left value is going to be added to the attacker's attack power. So in this case it's a 2. So that gets discarded. It's very similar to Combat Commander, where you're using uh, different, different numbers on the cards for different purposes and ignoring the rest of the card. So in that case it's a 2, so I add 2. And there are cards in here that add negative amounts, like a negative 1 and negative 2. <clears throat> so once that's done, then you determine the differential, so the difference between the two. If the person who is firing is higher than the person that is the target, then they are going to take damage. So in this case, there's a difference of 21 minus 16, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, a difference of 5. So you can take this damage token and place it on the 5 here. And then you look at that little red number down there in the corner. The little red number is a 3. So since the differential is 5, it does 3 damage to the opponent. So right now the Panzer Grenadier already has 2 damage to it. If we add another 3, that brings it to a grand total of 5, which is the unit's total morale. So that unit is actually destroyed. And the unit that succeeded has the option to advance into that space. Now that they're in that space, they add a control marker because they now control that space. Now, if the Panzer Grenadiers was not destroyed, say they took uh, four damage total, so their total morale, uh, I'm sorry, let's find that here, it was negative four. Then everything would reset back up and now the Panzer Grenadier gets a whole 18 step combat fire sequence. But since they've already taken hits, they're going to already start with minus four value to their attack. So this is a, the engineers are soft unit, they do, Panzer Grenadier does eight damage to soft units minus the four damage that they took. So even though both sides get to attack equally, it is better obviously to be the first player because you're going to knock down the, hopefully knock down the attack strength of the person that attacks second. After battle is completed, so let's say uh, he wasn't killed, he stayed with his negative four, and say during this, uh, the, the fire back, my engineers suffered uh, two damage. Then to determine who is the actual winner of the battle, it's the, it's the unit that took the fewest damage. So Panzer Grenadier took four, engineers took two, so the engineers win because they inflicted more damage. 
Now, if the attacker, the person that initiated the attack, won, the defender must retreat. So that's basically how it happens. Uh, you're going to be moving up and down the board, adding new units, playing various operations cards, having combat, playing combat cards, and the game will end uh, depending on what the scenario states. But all the scenarios are different. Some have objective points that you need to capture um, and other such things like that. So what do I think about Panzer General? Uh, well, first let me tell you about uh, the things that I enjoyed. I like how there are a lot of different cards. There's a lot of different units. Um, I really enjoy um, uh, military history. Uh, it has actual real photographs on the cards and there's a wide variety of different units. And that's really neat uh, to see. Uh, the, uh, the cards are on a very, very thick, excellent cardstock. Uh, I'd say just about GMT quality cardstock. Although some of them have uh, just a couple, maybe three or four or five, have a little bit of a cutting error uh, when they came off the machines, but I don't think that's that big of a deal. Also, uh, I kind of like how it's, it's fairly quick playing and very tactical. You're playing cards, you're moving, you know, you're attacking back and forth. It's very uh, confrontational, of course. It's a war game. And uh, it's not going to take uh, a whole weekend or a month to play like some of those ones out there. Uh, so what didn't I like about this game? Well, first, since I kind of talked about the cards, I'm going to talk about some of the other components. The little oval markers here are one-sided, which I uh, mentioned before, and uh, that's kind of sloppy. I don't like that. Uh, yeah, they probably saved uh, maybe money only printing one side, but, you know, this game commands a $60 MSRP, and for $60 you'd think that they could print both sides. So I, I didn't really like that. Uh, also, kind of, I touched on that whole river thing. It, it's kind of funky that the rivers really mean nothing. Same with there's lakes. They don't, they don't do anything. And having a bridge just takes that negative one attack modifier and knocks it down to a zero. So that's kind of hokey. Uh, also, the rule book. Very poorly written rule book. Uh, I mean, it's it's relatively clear in the things that it states, but it's it's very difficult to go back and reference things. Like, there's all sorts of rules thrown in there in these long paragraphs that you're totally going to forget, and they're not called out or bolded or anything like that. So it, you just have to kind of remember them. Um, and there's also a fair amount of typos. There's actually even a, a picture in here that shows some tokens that actually don't even exist. Uh, so, uh, I think there needed to be a little bit more uh, proofreading um, and copy editing of the rulebook, which, uh, since this is the second game in the series, you think they would have fixed that. Also, this is the player aid. It is just the combat steps. It is all 18 steps of the combat, which is really more like 36 steps, since you have to do the whole thing twice, usually. And it's basically just verbal diarrhea from the manual. I, I hate that. Um, I'm pretty sure there's some uh, player age sheets on the Geek that make it much better, uh, that actually tell uh, more information so you don't have to keep looking in the book. Uh, that's uh, not a very well done player age. It is on a nice thick cardstock, I'll give them that. But they really should have utilized this, and at least both sides, to put all those little fine tuned nitpicky rules. Um, onto it. Okay, what else? This. What is this? This is. I hate this thing. I think each player should have had their own little player sheet, maybe some dials or, or something like that, especially for sixty dollars. Um, but uh, they use this, uh, which is kind of funky because you know you got to have it situated one way, and it's you know it's funky. Also, look at that. This is how it comes out of the box. It's the same thing in Allied Assault. It's terribly warped. Well, not terribly, but it's warped enough that it's annoying. And, the, and since it's printed on uh, seemingly the same stock as the tiles, they're warped as well. Um, not nearly as much, but when you have all of them laid down and there's some scenarios that use almost all the tiles, you know, none of them lay flat, it's just, but it looks like, you know, a, uh, a slate floor, everything is, all the corners are sticking up all over the place, it just looks messy, it looks, it just doesn't look clean, which, you know, you don't expect it to, because it's not uh, a, a board, but, 
it's it looks sloppy nonetheless. Finally, sorry, I usually don't mean to gripe so much, but uh, you know I got to get it all out. Is the miniatures? I didn't explain the miniatures at all during the game, if you noticed, and the reason for that is there is no reason to have these. They're they're, they're a gimmick. Um, what the rules tell you to do is place the associated infantry piece on a card when you bring it out. So when you bring out an infantry piece, you put a little infantry soldier on it. When you bring out artillery, you put an artillery uh, token on it. And when you bring out a tank, you put a little miniature tank on it. And that's to help you quickly identify what the cards are. But all the cards have a symbol on them anyway, and they say what they are. Uh, so I, I think these are kind of a gimmick, so they could write on the box that, hey, we're including 80 miniatures. Um, but I think that's a little bit misleading because these miniatures aren't actually used for any real in-game purpose. So uh, that's... I don't like being negative, but uh, there's a lot of negatives to this game. I think it's a, a fun little game uh, to play with a friend, you know, maybe play it in a little tournament style, play two, you know, best two out of three, something like that. Uh, play different scenarios, and it's quick, and if you can get over the errors in the rules, uh, there is um, a couple good threads on uh, BGG where the designer answered a lot of the uh, questions people had or the vagueness of the rule book, and you can get over that uh, those two cards, those two special cards, let me grab here, that are misprinted, that are unit cards but have action backs. And these are like really strong units. These are like your special unit. You have one of each, uh, or one per side. So if you can get over that and kind of the sloppiness of it, I mean, it's definitely a fun little game. It, it's, uh, I don't want to detract anyone from trying it out because, uh, you know, it, it can, it, it's a fun little game. But... I would not pay $60 for this, and I know they've been uh, practically giving it away. I think I got it at Miniature Market's Black Friday sale for like $15 each or something silly like that. And for that price, I, I think it's fun and it's worth it. Um, but uh, it's it's not uh, a Memoir 44. It's, it's not a Combat Commander. Um, it definitely does not have the polish that those games have. I think it sh should have had more playtesting, better quality control, especially with big names, big video game names on it, like uh, Ubisoft. Why is Ubisoft on there? Well, this is actually an Xbox Live Arcade game. Um, it's very similar to the board game. I've never played it. I've kind of checked it out online. Um, and I think maybe this works a little bit better online because you can let your Xbox handle all 36 steps of the combat instead of you having to use that clunky sheet. Uh, also, the single player is a little clunky. I would not recommend it um, unless uh, you have nothing better to do uh, with your time. You don't have any of the other great Solitaire War games like uh, D-Day at Omaha Beach or um, Labyrinth or any of those other great Solitaire games. So. Um, that's, that's pretty much it. I'm going to stop rambling now. Um, it's a, it's a fun little game. I'd recommend you try it out if you have the opportunity. I would not pay top dollar for it. It's not the best war game out there, but it's, it's not terrible either. Um, so, give it a try if you have the opportunity. Thanks for playing. Thanks for watching, actually. I don't know why I said that. It's getting late. Okay.